Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar in which we're going to be talking about the risks associated with managing people. So just to let you know, first of all, that a copy of the slides are going to be sent out to you in due course um, after the event um, and also a link to the recording so you can watch it back on demand. And as usual, um, just like to introduce ourselves. I'm Victoria Templeton. I'm the HR Knowledge Manager here at HR Solutions. And I'm joined today by Sue Watson. Sue's our Operations Director. And together, we're going to be taking you through the topic, taking your questions, answering your polls. Um, so do reach out to us through the question and chat fields. And because we've got so many of you today, we've all had to place you all on mute. But of course, we do like to have your involvement in our webinars. So. Um, First of all, we'll do that by inviting you to ask us questions. And you can do that by um, looking at your screen. You'll see now the um, image of your GoToWebinar question panel. Simply type in your question, and then we'll aim to read out and answer as many as we can at the end. And if, is it, if it isn't possible, then we'll follow up with everyone afterwards. And another way in which we all like to get um, you involved is through the use of polls. You'll know when we're about to run a poll because you'll see this slide. Polls are really helpful, not only to the running of our webinar, but actually we find that it helps everyone on the mm. webinar to gain an idea of what other businesses are doing or thinking on a particular topic. They are confidential. We just know, obviously, the numbers of um, how people are voting on the question that's put forward. But before we make a start, I did want to just bring you um, some breaking news. It's probably, if you work in HR, this is what's probably going to be on your mind um, moving forward in that today is the day of the launch of the new Employment Rights Bill. It's going to be published later today. And this bill is expected to bring significant changes to how we manage people and will likely bring the biggest changes we've seen in decades. It's significant. A couple of months back, we did run a webinar which covered um, the areas that we think is going to be covered in the bill. So we'll send a link to that recording as well in the email uh, that follows today's events. But just to flag on this one slide here before we get going on our um, scheduled webinar, this is to illustrate the extent of the changes. It's going to be significant because, as you can see, it touches on all areas of the employment life cycle. So um, I thought I'd bring you the latest on that. And please do keep in touch with us via our socials, our website. If you're a client, then obviously your uh, consultant will be liaising with you. Um, but do keep in touch with regards to how the bill progresses. And there you see, you can contact us by telephone, socials, or email. And as I said, if you're um, a client of ours, then obviously get in touch with your consultant too. So, returning to today's agenda, so I, we've got lots to go through. I thought a good starting point would be to understand in real terms what it means to defend an employment tribunal, because ultimately that's where the risks can lead you to. I'll then move on to discussing the fundamentals of the employment relationship, because this then provides that context for understanding the types of claim. And then we'll move on to sharing with you our tips for how you can prevent claims and what to do should you receive one. And as I said earlier, as usual, we'll be taking your questions at the end. And we do like to run um, a poll fairly early on, just to give us an idea of um, everybody's setup and circumstances. So we're going to run our first poll. And that's really more about understanding your business that you operate in and uh, the size of the business. Let's see. Okay, I will close yeah. that poll and share those results. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so generally um, covers all aspects. Uh, yeah. Most of you large organisations, more than 250. Um, we've got some micro businesses as well. So I think you're all going to be, um, well, you will all be um, impacted by um, what's to come in terms of employment law. And obviously today's content is going to be relevant to everybody. And then we've just got a couple of um, other questions. And it's about the makeup of your workforce, whether you engage workers. So that could be your seasonal staff, casual workers, agency workers. OK, I will close yep. that poll and share those results. Oh, very nearly 50-50. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, Thank let's you. move past and the then, next one. Do you use self-employed contractors at all in your business? And then I will close and share that one. Okay. Yes. That's nearly almost half 50, 50 as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, a couple more before we get going. And that's around tribunals themselves. This one's going the same way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will close and share that. Oh, result of <laughs> nearly, very nearly 50 50 um okay at one point it was <laughs> <laughs> so all very very close these aren't they Split yeah 50 /50. i think is there one more yeah there yeah. is just are you yeah, currently you dealing with the tribunal <laughs> as i said these are confidential so we just know the percentages of the responses <clears throat> Okay, I will close and share those. Okay, so uh, 20, definitely some people. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I hope they're all going through okay. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, there'll be some things that you can take away from today's webinar. And obviously, for the 77% of you that haven't, um, this webinar will be a good uh, checking point just to check um, your current working practices and um, just assessing to what extent you're um, prepared for potential risks. So thank you for sharing that information with us. That's really um, useful. So I'm gonna just um, get going now. And really, I think the, the important or the interesting thing to start off with is actually looking at tribunal wards. Um, we've got some interesting data um, because it actually puts into context around what we're talking about today. So I have obtained the latest um, figures from the Ministry of Justice. So what you can see are the um, key claims, not all discrimination claims here, they've highlighted just these particular ones. Um, and it's the mean award, which is where you calculate the total value of all awards that have been made over the period and dividing it by the number of cases. Um, and then I would say, if you could see, you know, looking at these figures from experience, and in understanding current statistics that we have around ill health, it isn't actually a surprise that disability discrimination is the most prevalent type of claim here. And we'll, we'll come on to show that even further on the next slide. But as you can see, um, the awards are um, significant. Um, so I thought that'd be useful just to set the context. And the second slide is actually showing you the maximum award that is actually being paid. So um, just bear in mind that when there's dis um, discrimination claims, there's no cap. Um, tribunals have a framework in which they uh, use to determine the level of compensation, but that framework also allows for exceptional cases to be given unlimited amounts. And as you can see, I mentioned the disability on the previous slide, you know, the largest amount that we, we've seen paid out is over a million pounds. Um, as I said, there is a framework in which tribunals use and um, it takes into account the nature of the discrimination, the length and duration of how long it's been going on and all things like that. So um, whilst it looks alarming, realistically and on average day to day, perhaps you know those figures that we're seeing on the previous slide are more the realistic ones, but it's just to make you aware that uh, claims are unlimited or awards are unlimited, should I say. But obviously there are other things to factor in uh, when you're thinking about tribunals um, and when you're defending, you know, you've got the management time and effort. So not only um, there's that important need in managing the issues under your internal procedures, your discipline procedures, grievance procedures, but then when um, the relationship breaks down and there's challenges and issues and you get those tribunals, it's actually dealing with it. So for the 23% of you that, um, voted in that poll a moment ago about having to currently deal with them you'll you'll probably you you'll be understanding where i'm coming from here the time and um, effort that it takes in dealing with the actual claim and then of course 
aside from the response and there's a whole piece that goes into preparing for tribunals, drafting witness statements, uh, preparing your witnesses, providing the support and coaching they will need, um, and then of course attendance at tribunal. Tribunals can be a single day, they could be several days, or they could be weeks. Um, and then on top of that, you've got fees that are incurred through the use of solicitors and barristers. Um, some employers use solicitors all the way through, including representing them at tribunal. Um, other employers use solicitors on the initial stages, and then um, the employer will perhaps use a barrister when it comes to the hearing itself. All very much depends on the nature of the case and complexity. Um, so it's not just the awards that you need to factor in, it's all the uh, time and effort and uh, costs that come in with external parties. And also a big um, factor to consider is the publicity that, that comes with it. You know, we're seeing more and more use of social media, uh, the news stories. If you think about uh, the P&O ferries issue from two years back where they made mass redundancies, you know, there is all that publicity that goes with it. And of course, um, there's always a test case and you don't ever want to be that employer who is the test case because your employer's name will be branded around um, for years to come. So there is a lot to consider when um, thinking about tribunals. But in terms of the actual fundamentals themselves um, and looking at the whole employment relationship, um, I wanted to just set out um, essentially the foundations because this is where the risks and the claims arise from. So the starting point, obviously the employment relationship is founded on mutual obligations. The employee has that duty to provide the work and the employer's duty is to provide uh, the pay for that work. Contract of employment can be written, oral or implied um, and it outlines the rights and obligations. So the employment contract is founded on several core duties and obligations. You've got the um, duty to maintain the employee's trust and confidence. And we know from a particular employment case, Malik and another versus the Bank of Credit and Commerce, that says that employees must not, without reasonable and proper cause, conduct itself in a manner calculated and likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of trust and confidence between the employer and employee. So we have that, um, that means that we have to um, honour that trust and confidence. There's then a duty of care where the employer must make uh, take reasonable care to protect their employees from foreseeable harm. And there's a duty of fidelity, which is where um, the employees must act uh, legally act in good faith. So there are many, many core principles of the contract of employment and the employment relationship. But it's also formed based on many statutory rights that may uh, that arise from several key pieces of employment legislation. So I've just highlighted in the pink box here just um, an idea to give you an example as to what they include. Obviously, it's not the full exhaustive list. There are many, many more. But as you'll see from the, uh, the box here, it, it um, includes a requirement to give the written statement of employment particulars by uh, day one of employment, um, employees' rights to have an itemized pay statement, uh, time off work for certain um, circumstances, paid annual leave, et cetera, et cetera. So there were many statutory rights that are underpinned within the contract of employment. And contract law means that you must uphold the terms of the contract and where the terms are not upheld, then this is where there's that legal breach and both parties must uphold their terms. What's crucial when recruiting someone as well, and as we saw on the poll, many of you use workers um, as well as employees. There are some of you that, have you, that also use self-employed contractors. What's crucial when you recruit someone is to make sure that they are employed or engaged on the right contractual terms. There are th currently three employment statuses, employee, worker and the self-employed. The first two, employee and worker, have a legal definition set in law. Self-employed is a little bit more, um, not as straightforward. But if you incorrectly determine somebody's employment status uh, wrong, then that's where there's uh, risk for employers because ultimately each employment status 
brings certain amount of employment rights. So if you're not giving somebody their full rights, clearly that's where they have uh, recourse to the tribunals. So the um, contract of employment is ultimately at the heart of the employment relationship. We also have other pieces of employment legislation. So the Equality Act uh, provides protection from discrimination in the workplace. And it's about providing the protection from um, from discrimination from those who hold a protected characteristic. So I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar, but that includes age, sex, disability, sexual orientation. You've got religion or belief, pregnancy, maternity leave, marriage and civil partnership, race, including color, nationality, uh, ethnic and um, or national origin, and gender reassignment. So there's um, several protected characteristics for which an employee can bring a discrimination claim. And that discrimination claim can be either direct, where they feel they've been treated less favorably to someone because of their protected characteristic. It could be direct discrimination by association. And what we mean by that is that they're being discriminated against because of who they are connected to. And that person they're connected to holds one of the protected characteristics. There's also direct discrimination by perception, and that's where an employee or worker is discriminated against because they are perceived to hold one of those protected characteristics, even if it's not the case. So there are many forms of direct discrimination. There's also indirect discrimination, and that's about how an employer sets their policies, rules, practices, um, and if they were to do so in a way that it disadvantages a certain group of the workforce who holds a protected characteristic, that's your indirect discrimination. So, for example, if you make everybody have to only work full time, clearly there is an issue there because you'll find that um, most working parents who juggle childcare and work tend to be uh, the female. So if you're forcing people to be always working full time, that's where there's a potential uh, conflict with the Discrimination Act. There's victimization as well, where somebody is treated less favorably because they've been involved with either raising a discrimination claim, supporting somebody in raising their discrimination or harassment complaint. Um, and then of course, we have harassment as well, which is unlawful when it's related to certain protected characteristics. There's also sexual harassment, and there's that. Um, it's unlawful to harass somebody when the harassment is specifically of a sexual nature. Um, the person doesn't need to show that it was because of their sex or because of their sexual orientation, but it's the unwanted conduct is of a sexual nature. And in the next few weeks, we're going to see the law change on this because there's going to be a new legal duty placed on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment occurring during the course of employment. So this new duty comes into force from the 26th of October and it will require you to take those reasonable steps to prevent it. Now, it is quite a broad piece of legislation in that it's during the course of employment. So it could be um, through uh, work social uh, functions and events. It could be off-site visits with clients or attending work conferences or attending networking events. Or it could be online correspondence between two employees that takes place using work equipment. So um, this is a big change. Um, you can look at our webinar we ran a couple of months ago that's on demand again we'll put that link in our email that comes out to you after the event because that's a really important uh, change in employment law that's just around the corner another fundamental aspect of managing people is around ensuring there's always a fair dismissal if there's going to be a dismissal and the employment legislation requires an employer to carry out a fair dismissal, so it must be for one of the statutory fair reasons. So written in the law, we know that you can dism dismiss for somebody's conduct, their capabilities, that's performance or um, sickness absence. You can dismiss uh, potentially uh, for redundancy, statutory restriction, or some other substantial reason. Um, it, um, is only a fair dismissal 
if a fair procedure has been followed, uh, the dismissal was reasonable in the circumstances, and the decision that you took to dismiss uh, the individual fell within a reasonable range of responses. So there were certain hurdles to get over to demonstrate that fair dismissal, which is why having those clear policies and procedures, trained line managers are fundamental to the employment relationship. Another crucial consideration is that an employment tribunal will expect employees to follow guidance set out in codes of practices. So the ACAS code of practice, for example, on disciplinary grievance, um, it is expected that you adhere to that when you're carrying out um, a disciplinary, for example, or um, where there's a grievance, uh, you've got to conform to that code of practice, as well, of course, your own company policies. So there are other protections too. So first of all, you know, if we think about health and safety, although they are generally progressed through other types of court, they can also be connected to employment tribunal claims and we'll um, come on to that shortly. There's also protection in regards to somebody who blows the whistle, protected disclosures, um, because they must not suffer detriment for doing that. And you've got also protections around how you uh, how your employer uses your data so uh, a more general piece of legislation is your um, UK GDPR or the Data Protection Act of 2018 again they're through a separate court but nonetheless they um, obviously can relate to employment practices <clears throat> and then um, I mentioned a moment ago about codes of practice um, now these are critical, as I've sort of indicated a moment ago. Um, they are published by public organisations such as ACAS or the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So these are guidelines for employers to follow in certain employment areas. And whilst they're not legally binding, where there's a failure to comply with them, it can be taken into account by an employment tribunal. Um, and for some, in some situations, can increase the amount of compensation that's given to an employee by up to 25%, where the employer has unreasonably failed to follow the guidance. So I'd say, just uh, to highlight, the Discipline and Grievance uh, Code is a fundamental core document that um, your employment policies should be aligned with. Um, I mentioned it earlier around the new duty on preventing uh, sexual harassment. I would highlight that you are uh, aware of the technical guidance listed at the bottom there uh, that the um, EHRC has just published in terms of their guidance for preventing harassment and sexual harassment. And on that, um, we've got this new legal duty coming in around the need to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment occurring. But we've, I just wanted to share with you what we've done to create tools and documents to help employers. So um, keep an eye out in the coming days and weeks for a new online free uh, risk audit that we're gonna be launching. That will be um, a good tool to just assess your current working practices uh, to see where you are in terms of um, the new legal duty. So as I said, just keep an eye out either on our website, social medias, or sign up to our newsletters. We've also created a new detailed risk assessment template um, with supporting guidance available as well. That's on our doc shop. So it really gets to the detail about the employment relationship. So we'll look at all aspects of that and assess um, the level of risk uh, for your business when it comes to this particular duty. Um, there's also obviously line management and employee training uh, that could be tailored to your business. And we've recently uh, published our new and updated bullying and harassment policy, which is gonna be fundamental, and a disciplinary policy as well. So they're available on our doc shop. And um, we do offer as well um, a free 30 minute call with one of our advisors. So if you did want to uh, get some advice, sense check, then um, do get in touch with us. As I said, we've got that free 30 minute call. So there's probably gonna be a lot of talk about that. Employees might get to hear about it as well. So it's a very high profile um, change in legislation that's just around the corner. 
So we're going to run um, three, two or three more polls now just to um, see a few areas about policies and things. So first of all, have you started to prepare for the new legal duty to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment? Okay, I'll share those results now. Yep. There we go. It's a good number half. Yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I'll just ask the next one, shall I? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then we've got... Is, yeah. Yeah. So, um, just out of interest, if you think about the last 12 months, so October last year, have you um, carried out a review of your contracts, policies? Have you audited your working practices? Carried out any training at all? Let us know and then we'll... Um, interesting to see what um, other organisations are doing. Okay, brilliant. They're all really good numbers. Um, you know that it's happened to some extent um, and uh, this next poll is actually quite more specific and it's thinking about all the changes that we saw back in April so if you think about the flexible working rights changed we had extensions to worker protections when uh, pregnant and during red redundancy etc and annual leave which um, I'm sure everybody will be familiar with all the changes that happened with that so did you update your policies in the um, with those changes? Just close that one now and share those results. Yeah. So there we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So for the twenty four percent of you, um, as I said, the areas that have changed and it'll be um, would recommend you go back to look at your policies, is that the flexible working rules have changed in that. Uh, employees can now put two requests in in a year and it's from day one of employment so you don't need your 26 weeks um, whenever there's a redundancy uh, process then the law has changed around who's protected for being offered suitable alternatives so that's another area and then annual leave so if the 24 percent of you um, employ workers either on a casual basis zero hours um, then there's been some significant changes on that. So I would um, urge you to go and, and have a look at your documents and practices in those areas. Thank you, Sue. Um, and then I'm just going to move on now to talking about the types of claims. So we've got an idea of the framework um, and the foundations that underpin the employment relationship, but what are the claims that we have? So the first and probably the most common um, would be around the dismissal being unfair and at the moment employees need two years service to uh, raise a claim for that however and as we'll probably see in the new employment rights bill that's going to be published today the government are looking to scrap that two years and we'll get to a position where you don't need any qualifying service to be able to claim unfair dismissal so this is fundamentally uh, or significant uh, development in employment law it's going to have massive implications if you think about your probation periods and things like that so um, first of all the unfair dismissal at the moment you need your two-year service um, and if you remember um, on that previous slide what makes a fair dismissal is that obviously you've, there's got to be for one of the five statutory reasons it's got to be um, fair the process followed fair um, be reasonable in the circumstances and um, uh, be a reasonable response. You then have automatically unfair dismissal, which is very different because the employee doesn't need any qualifying service and that the dismissal would automatically be unfair if the reason was related to one of the specific grounds that are listed in the, in the Employment Rights Act. So in the legislation, there is a long list of um, areas in which a dismissal would automatically be um, unfair regardless of what process or approach you took 
And so it could be, for example, um, somebody made a protected disclosure and they were then dismissed because of that. Or they try to assert a statutory right. Um, or perhaps they um, uh, something to do with them needing to take family leave. Um, if a dismissal is in connection or in part, principle in part to um, to that reason, then it will be automatically unfair and they don't need the two year service. There's then the breach of contract. So as you think about what I said on one of the earlier slides, both parties have a legal duty to conform to their obligations. Clearly, when um, if the employer wasn't to do it, then that's where the employee has scope to raise a breach of contract claim. And wrongful dismissal. This is about where uh, well, it's a specific type of claim in which an employee alleges the employer breached contractual terms when terminating the employment. So. Um, it's unlawful termination of employment by reason of a breach, um, a breach of the terms. It could be, for example, the employer failed to give the required statutory notice when they dismiss somebody. So that's a wrongful dismissal. And then you have constructive dismissal, where the actions of the employer faces, uh, forces, sorry, the employee to resign. You know, it's such a serious breach of the contract of employment. They feel they've got no other um, option but to resign from their employment. If it's found to be a sufficiently serious breach with connection to the resignation, the law will treat the resignation as a form of unfair dismissal. So as it stands, to bring a claim, they need that two-year service. But as I said, this is all looking to change um, under the new government. Discrimination, which I've touched on on one of the previous slides, um, it can take the form of, uh, in several ways, direct, indirect, by association and perception. Not many people perhaps realise about that form of discrimination. And soon we're going to obviously see extended to a further duty to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment. Protected disclosures, they're your whistleblowing claims. So um, individuals can bring claims for protected um, disclosures and how they've been treated as a result of doing so. And then health and safety, whilst I said earlier, it's more of a, um, would go through a, a, another court. There are some employment tribunal cases that touch on health and safety issues. So if you think back to, for example, the pandemic, um, one example could be an employee has been dismissed because the principal reason or the circumstance that led them um, to perhaps refusing to come to work, i.e. the pandemic, was a dangerous and it was serious and imminent and which they therefore could not reasonably have been expected or um, to attend work. That kind of health and safety claim um, can be raised as part of the Employment um, Rights Act of 96. So there are um, health and safety um, risks as well that you need to be mindful of. So, um, we thought that this latter part of the webinar would look at how you can prevent claims and what our tips um, would be for that. Um, so we're going to share some ideas. Um, I think this is probably a good point to look at the role of human resources in helping businesses to prevent claims. You may have your own HR function in your business. You may be the sole person who has been given the responsibility of dealing with employees if you're a small business. Um, but I just wanted to sort of put into context how um, I guess the HR function is instrumental to business. And first of all, if you think about, you know, HR um, always remain up to date with the latest employment law, as well as the latest trends and best practice. So that means that the business has the right policies in place, handbooks, contracts and employment, all of which are legally compliant. Um, they're practical to use. And of course, they're commercially robust because they're written in a way uh, knowing the employment law so that it protects the employer. Record keeping and documentation. So HR, you know, is almost like um, supports in accurate record keeping. You know, record keeping is key in defending tribunal claims. Um, compliance and um, you know, to data protection laws is also critical, but ultimately the data that you hold about somebody is effectively your defense at a tribunal, like I've just said. 
So HR can ensure the processes and storing of personal data is done so in accordance with obviously the UK GDPR as well as the Data Protection Act. You've then got to think about training and education. Um, you know, that's fundamental in protecting the business from risk. Training is just one of many ways in which you can, um, uh, uh, I guess, prevent claims. Um, you can build your defense when you're uh, responding to tribunal claims to show that actually, no, we trained our managers on how to recruit fairly and lawfully because we carried out um, unconscious bias training, for example. So that is a big factor when you're defending a claim, the fact that you can evidence that you've carried out training. Monitoring and auditing is a key part because ultimately it keeps you um, aware of where there may be gaps and therefore what you need to focus on and prioritise. You know, so it's about monitoring your, your practices on ensuring ongoing legal compliance. Um, so it very much involves internal audits, reviewing procedures, um, assessing the effectiveness of current policies as well. And then I'd say probably the biggest part of um, human resources is the employee relations, ER side of it. So um, that's your disciplinary, grievance, performance, absence management. These are probably the main areas that will take up most of the management time. And most, I guess, are the main reasons for tribunal claims. So mishandling issues or even a failure to handle can have significant implications for the business. And as we've seen, there's a wide variety of avenues to claim for employees. So HR does play a crucial role in managing these issues uh, by ensuring the uh, complex processes are handled fairly, consistently, and of course, within the law. And risk management. So HR um, is able to work with the business to proactively identify and assess potential vulnerabilities in current practices and therefore mitigate the risks associated um, with non-compliance. But what other advice can we give you? So this slide really, I mean, you'll have the slides after the event and it is just really a very high level. It's not an exhaustive list. There is so much in the employment life cycle where you can take steps to proactively mitigate against the risk of tribunal. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all of it um, and or to cover the entire employment life cycle, but I've just jotted down here some key areas. So if you think about your recruitment, you know, things like having multiple interviewers carrying out the interview so it's not a one-on-one -on -one situation so that if you were to get any um, claims and you've got that um, other person to verify that actually no we did carry out the process in a fair way we did ask all of these questions etc or it might be um, you know bias training is um, a massive recommendation because it's about understanding how unconscious bias can happen you know you're not realizing it that perhaps it's happening but it can happen so there are many ideas here even ideas relating to how you construct your contracts of employment because it's so important to ensure your uh, employment status is correct that the contracts are robust and therefore you know the well-drafted employment contracts are vital policies must be comprehensive you must have policies definitely for your disciplinary grievance, bullying and harassment, health and safety, although there's many, many more policies. And it's about making sure they're accessible to everyone because, you know, you will fall down at tribunal if there is any argument on the claimant side that actually I didn't get access to that document. I didn't know about it. And then you've got other areas, your disciplinary and grievance, making sure it's aligned with the ACAS code, making sure you seek advice as well before making any big decision, um, whether you know, you've got your on-site HR team, um, just make sure you seek that advice, especially before uh, you're thinking of dismissing somebody. And then things like your training, um, you know, your equal ops training, your bullying and harassment should be mandatory especially now with that new legal duty coming into force. And we know from previous case rulings that actually um, a one-off training isn't sufficient. It needs to be regular. It can't be stale and out of date. 
So mandatory training is really important in certain areas of um, management, um, people management. So that's just a snapshot of things to think about. There are far more ways in which you can take steps to prevent um, claims, but it was just a few ideas to get you thinking and um, you know to think if there's anything that perhaps you else uh, you need to put in as well. So before we just move on to some steps on how to deal with a claim, I'm just going to run um, a few more polls um, and give my voice a rest. <laughs> So I've just launched the first one, which is, do you have an HR department or a person who is responsible for HR? Okay. Okay, I'll just close and share those results. So yep. interestingly, we've got the majority were in-house on the yeah. call today. Um, which is which is amazing um and yeah absolutely if you um need support in any of this it can be a very lonely place especially if you are the only hr person in-house um and we are very much used to um just being the sounding board um so um we try and support hr particularly yeah. sole hr people in-house in but yeah it's a tough tough place to be um yeah. And let me just move on to the next one, because I think that's linked, isn't it? And it's sort of which which of the following policies do you have in place? You can select more than one on this one as well. Okay, I will yep. close and share that result. So, oh, well, good it. majority have got mm. the um, all of those in place, which is which is brilliant. Yeah, uh, and absolutely the the starting point. I guess the next question is, have you reviewed them recently? Or do they comply with the latest duties and the forthcoming yeah. changes? <laughs> which is the next I, challenge for us all. Yeah, and I would say just on that, it's not the obvious ones like you bullying and harassment and disciplinary that obviously need changing but actually any associated policies as well so if you have a policy for um, business travel work events um, and things like that loan working make sure you review those policies as well because um, there will be that obligation on taking reasonable steps to prevent it and social media as yeah. well but, uh, yeah yeah social media, yeah very important yeah. and then this is one is the to do with the training. So do you provide the regular line management training on management people? That's always the challenge. <laughs> yeah. Especially if if um if you have a um a medium to high turnover of staff, it's keeping them trained is in your in your processes and policies is important but hard to keep momentum on. Yeah. Okay, I will close and share those results. There we go, that is okay. Okay, yeah, so actually just under half of you don't. And again, that's probably as a takeaway from today, that's a biggie um, because it forms part of your defence, the fact that you've got well-trained managers in the business and therefore they know um, that they need to um, carry out disciplinaries in a fair way, um, how to make decisions around disciplinary, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, definitely make that as a priority, as a takeaway. Absolutely. And then I think, is it one more this section? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it, or is that it? Is it one more on this one? Oh, okay. I've got one more, there you go. <laughs> Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, oh, one more, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's just a, a re. Yeah. That's... 
would be interesting actually with all the news coming out about employment rights the fact that it um, brings it to people's minds and therefore people become more aware of their employment rights and therefore if they feel they're not getting them just, uh, grievances and uh, claims and things like that so it'd be mm. interesting to see if we see an influx of uh, tribunal claims coming through absolutely but always a case when there's new legislation but in particular now because it's going to be significant isn't it yeah and it, uh, the scope of the legislation is more, more and more people all the while are, are yeah. caught by the scope um so yeah we've got pretty much even okay. um across all of those things um yeah. so yeah the sort of 40 to 50 percent um will prioritize all of those areas so yeah good. that's good yeah brilliant okay thank you sue okay, thank you and then uh, before we uh, see if we've got time for questions i'm just going to um conclude with actually um some steps to take if you receive a claim um because i guess you know you might have all the best practices in place but you can still get claims unfortunately um so even the best employers face claims from time to time um so i you know our, our top five points would be don't delay that's first and foremost because you have a strict deadline from the date the employee's claim form um was posted submitted to you so you the clock starts and you've got that 28 days to provide your what's called et3 the second thing is around the importance of assessing the situation so are they looking for reinstatement and come back to their old job do they want re-engagement when they come back but to a different job or are they looking for that financial compensation the first two then obviously give that serious consideration because they clearly don't feel the relationship has broken down irretrievably but if they're asking for that compensation then there could be an opening for you to consider settling seek employment advice early on um, this is crucial because that professional advice whether it's from a HR specialist or an employment lawyer it helps you to understand your obligations in the process your rights as an employer where things can be challenged and advise you on the steps you need to take and also they can assist you in gathering evidence helping to identify potential witnesses and support in building that strong case for you engaging with ACAS is important for early conciliation tribunals expect you to um, pursue that avenue um, there are obviously advantages in doing it because if you can avoid tribunal then um, obviously it will save time and money and you can address it through that ACAS conciliation process so it can help you to negotiate that settlement um, even if you can't get to the point of settling at that stage going through that process will give you a much clearer idea of the strength of your case and exactly what that person is looking for and um, consider a settlement as well I mean there's probably divided opinion on this um, it is very hard to step back and take an objective view if the employee has upset you or if the employee was particularly difficult to work with or if you feel the claim has no merit um, then you might feel inclined to fight it come what may from a principal point of view the other side of it is that tribunals are expensive you know we've seen from the statistics of the awards if you were to you know hopefully you would never be in the position but if you were to lose at tribunal we know what the awards can be like but also it's the management time and effort and the costs in the lead up to tribunal so for some employers they may take they may take that risk adverse decision and try and be pragmatic and look for settlement agreement um, and settling can happen right up until the day of or even during the, the tribunal um, so as I said it's a bit of a um, two-sided coin there um, some people feel very strongly and principled you know I'm going to have my day in court and defend we did not do this other employers perhaps want to take a more pragmatic approach so 
they're just some things that we would get you to think about if you do receive a claim. Hopefully you don't and you won't. Um, I'm going to just see if we've got time for a couple of questions and we've got some in, um, interesting information for you on the next slides as well. So if we can't answer all the questions, then we'll sure uh, get back to you as well after the event as a group communication. Hi, so we've we've had a a couple of um well a couple of questions all around the same thing and it's to do with training um and it was um could you use we regular webinar updates from say acas as a training um and i think the whole thing with any training however you provide it whether it's somebody sitting with somebody or whether it's um attending a webinar or whether it's attending a formal training course it's it's what you do to assess the effectiveness of that training and engagement. So if you do a, a follow-up questionnaire that's genuinely followed up or even have a, a post-training meeting um, to understand uh, what they learned from it and if they fully understand um, the objectives of the training um, and do they feel comfortable and confident in being able to manage any situation or identify any situation that needs further intervention. So I think it, the importance is around um, not necessarily how you train, but how you effective. use that and implement, how effective mm -hmm. it is in, in implementing your intentions, which is to ensure your staff and your manager in particular are um, trained in, in being aware yeah. of situations, aware of the law, so some of our webinars, yes, you could use um, because they, they are an awareness, we, we, but we do not um, purport them to be training. Um, that takes an awful lot longer. And in the time we have on a webinar, we can't go into all the detail, whereas training courses go into much more step by step detail and they identify a, an audience as being um, wanting to know all the information, not just the high level, which is what we present here. Mm -hmm. So. Again, it depends on whether you're training HR people or already have a, a significant understanding of the law or whether mm. you are training line managers who um, may not, might be new line managers and or new supervisors and, and actually don't have much of an awareness. So they will need much, much more. So yeah. I think it's, it's been able to say, yes, we train our managers, we feel, and it's, goes down to your risk assessment as well is sufficient in in protecting us should any situations arise that need managing that they will identify it and will manage it appropriately mm. and and so um i think that that's the question you have to ask when you're trying mm. to determine you know, whether it's reasonable if it's if it's sufficient uh the regularity will depend on how often the law changes and how often you um feel that they need reminding mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes you do need to do annual top-up training um sometimes uh, e-learning is good for that um as, as certainly for your regular annual refreshers um it can be good for the initial training as well um mm -hmm. particularly if it's um not just a 10 minute overview but it's um uh, a proper course that gives engagement in it you know you have to do uh, respond to questions and you're assessed at the end of it so that your understanding is assessed and you've then got evidence that they have shown their understanding of the training that's been delivered so again it's all down to the quality of the training um, in terms of achieving the objective you need it for um, yeah yeah and I, I'd say uh, take the new duty for example sexual harassment and EDI training equal ops training I put, you know, one hour's webinar, you'd, you'd struggle to argue how that gives you all the information you need. Um, but yeah. perhaps attending a webinar on um, a return to work interview, uh, process, return to work interview, solely on that particular topic. You know, it's all good stuff to show that you're a proactive manager, you, you're doing your best, you're trying your best, you're pursuing external learning opportunities um and that will just add to your um characteristics if you like as a line manager that your your intentions are there and you're doing your best to manage in the right and fair way 
that's all the questions were all around training oh, okay. really <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, yeah um so um before we've got one final poll that is coming up but just to let you know we offer the hr knowledge base so it's that online portal if you are in a standalone role or if you're a part of a bigger hr team that actually it would be valuable to you to have your template um letters contracts policies etc then um there's a qr code there there's also a link so do let us know and get in touch if that's something of interest we do offer a wide range of training courses. Obviously, we're doing a lot at the moment around the um, prevention of um, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, but there is so much more that we can also offer as well as ILM level accredited uh, courses as well. Webinars, we've got a lot coming up. So um, the November one is all about managing work-related functions and events, getting us all ready into the festive spirit and um, putting a damp on it around um, how you should manage it fairly to avoid claims. Um, we've then got in December our usual uh, annual one that's looking at the year ahead, but also how that ties in with your strategic people planning and how you need to sort of focus, especially with so much going on this year or next year even, um, then we're going to be looking at, at that in the December one. January, we're looking at the essentials for small employers, although it'll obviously um, be relevant to larger employers as well, because it will act as a good reminder. But this is really looking at the absolute minimum you should be doing if you're a small employer. We'll have our annual virtual employment law seminar again. That's um, early March. And then what we're doing in line with the new Employment Rights Bill that's being published today, we're going to be running several webinars, uh, February, March and April, um, all based around this new deal for working people, whether it's the implications of the day one on fair dismissal rights and the implications for that on the probation process, um, the employment relationship, what it will mean for that and understanding the pay implications because they are going to be uh, significant. So HR does play a critical role in ensuring um, organisations adhere to employment law. Many tribunals can be prevented. Um, so just wanted to let you know that we offer, there's a free HR risk audit. So. Um, it's on our main website and it's a matter of going through, it probably takes five minutes. Um, it'll ask you many, many questions about your entire working practices to do with managing people. And it will give you an assessment at the end and help you um, give some ideas or suggestions what um, should be priority for you. We have on our doc shop um, strategic HR plans. We're obviously going to be talking about strategic HR planning in our December webinar, so do sign up to that. I've got that noted here. I mentioned earlier about that free 30-minute um, HR advice call. And then we're also going to be introducing the risk assessment for the prevention of sexual harassment. So there's lots of things to be that you can take away that's available for you. Um, just let us know or go and have a look, reach out on the website. So here's the slide for the uh, risk audit. Um, there are actually several risk audits um, available. Obviously, for um, from a HR generic point of view, the HR risk audit, um, as I said, takes 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and there's a QR code to take you to it. So we're offering that free 30 minute consultation with one of our experienced HR advisors. It could be to do with that new duty that's coming in. It could be to do with performance, absence. Um, you know, there's that QR code, get in touch with us and then uh, we will be happy to help you. This is the link for November's webinar, as I said, um, getting ready for the festive period. Um, do um, sign up to attend that uh, 14th of November. We have a free download as well about um, strategic HR thinking and how it can align people and business strategies. Um, and that was written by several of us here um, talking about the latest trends and best practice um, in HR. 
But before we let you go, we just want to get your thoughts, really. If there's anything that you'd like to find out about of our services, please do get in touch. So do indicate on the poll um, that's coming up. Um, and then we'll get in touch. Yeah, all, all the updated documents and the links to all the risk audits are also on the knowledge base. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll let that one close. Lovely, thank you. There you go. So, um, thank you for hanging about those extra six minutes. Um, it has been a longer webinar today, obviously the nature of the topic, um, but thank you for taking the time out of your busy diary. I know everybody's busy at the moment. Thank you to Sue um, for helping with the questions and the polls, and um, hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>